Hello once again, everybody, and thank you for joining me here on this Tuesday, March 16th edition of ATS Radio. I'm your host, Adam Burke. I'll be joined today by Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. We'll talk a little bit of NFL free agency. We'll talk some college basketball with the NCAA tournament, golf with the Honda Classic, NASCAR with the Folds of Honor Quick Trip 500 down at Atlanta Motor Speedway. So we're going to cover a lot of ground, a lot of different sports betting markets here on this Tuesday edition of the show. Over at ATS.io, my 2021 MLB betting guide up has been up over there for a long time now. Looking at all 30 teams from a season win total standpoint, looking at the futures markets as well, two weeks and two days away from the start of the Major League Baseball season. So a good time to check out that guide if you have not already. Lots of great content there and also a lot of helpful fantasy baseball advice in that guide as well for you to check out. Previewed the NIT this morning over at ATS.io, so you can check that out. That starts on Wednesday night here. Also got region previews up for all four regions of the NCAA tournament. Lots of tournament coverage coming your way over at the website. And finally, make sure you download the ATS app, which you can find in the Google Play Store or in the Apple Store. Full article integration from the website, a bet tracker, an odd screen, a statistical database to help you handicap these games. Lots of things going on in that ATS app. Make sure you check it all out. With that, we bring on today's guest, and that is Mr. Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. And Brian, how's it going today, man? All right, Adam. Hanging in there, man. Getting ready for the tournament. Should be good stuff. Uh, excited. They jacked up the, I guess, what do you call it? You'd be able to, the attendance would be up to 50% now in, in sports books. So I think we'll actually get a pretty good atmosphere for the uh, NCAA tournament this week. We'll be out about on the road this week, too. So looking forward to it. Should be a fun week. Yeah, things uh, gradually getting back to normal a little bit here in the sports world. And, you know, it was great to have fans on hand again last week for the Players' Championship. And they certainly enhanced the atmosphere, especially when Justin Thomas poured in that eagle putt and, uh, you know, really kind of took control of that tournament. We'll talk about the Honda Classic later on in today's show. But lots of breaking news out there in the Twitterverse and all over the mainstream media with regards to NFL free agency and Technically speaking, teams are just agreeing to deals now, things that will be signed uh, over the next day or two. Dak Prescott off the board. We talked about that last week on your show, uh, getting a big deal from the Dallas Cowboys. A lot of the other top free agents getting franchise tagged. Shaq Barrett's going to stay at home with Tampa Bay. Uh, As you were telling me before the show, you know, the Bills, they kind of won free agency by retaining all of their guys but, man, lots of news, lots of movement here that will create some ripples out there in the futures markets. No, there's no doubt. I mean, the, the question is, you know, those free agent signings, is the guy ever a great fit? Uh, it works for some teams, other teams that the guys cash a big number and don't make that big an impact. But, I mean, clearly the Patriots realized they had a lot of work to be done in the division. And, you know, they get John o. Smith, the guy's a stud now – we're sitting there staring. They're going to get Hunter Henry, so they're going to have the two monster tight ends. Uh, then they they go and get the uh, what the stud linebacker from the Ravens, the Juden guy. Uh, but they they keep Cam Stewart. I that's Cam that Newton. I can't wait. Cam Stewart. <laughs> Cam Stewart. Uh, <laughs> He'll that, enjoy I, that one when you tell him. I do. I do so many things with Cam these days. No, we with Cam Newton. And the crazy thing is, but. Okay, if he's surrounded by talent, you know, can the thing work? The one thing is we watched and talked about them a lot last year. If they got behind, they were toast. They were, you know, they were one-dimensional. They were done. But clearly they got some pieces around for him. And you wondered if they'd be in a Deshaun Watson or Garoppolo or whatever. But as of today, it looks like it's noon. Well, I mean, I, I think they could still make a move if they decide to here, you know, or or maybe they kind of figure something out with the NFL draft, something like that, where – you know, Newton's contract, one year, $5 million, is is not really cost prohibitive to them if they figure out that they've got somewhere different that they can go. So, you know, $5 million for a backup, a, a capable backup at that, not really that bad of an expenditure in the NFL here. Uh, they also pick up Jalen Mills. That's a nice little signing uh, in the back seven. And that's the thing. Everyone's kind of talking about what the Patriots are doing here in free agency. And it's funny because I'm seeing people saying, oh, you know, Patriots plus four whatever to win the AFC East. That looks like a pretty good bet right now. Oh, the Patriots Super Bowl price. That looks good. And I'm sure you're sitting there as a Bills fan going, 
I mean, this team is just now, you know, hitting its stride, just hit its stride for the first time last year. I don't know. I always like when teams make big splashes in free agency or trade, something like that. And I can just sit there and look at the team who's already at the top of the mountain and go, yeah, that's just going to give me a better price on them. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, you know, you've always got to respect Belichick. The one thing is, you know, his model always was rack up compensatory picks and, you know, and get rid of guys when they get outpriced. But don't forget the one thing with the Patriots they're not talking about too, there are a bunch of guys that opted out last year too. So their defense should be better with guys that return. It comes down, it's a quarterback league. And, you know, Cam Newton, get it done. But, you know, for the Bills, when I say they won free agency, in in their eyes they won free agency because they weren't expected to be really active in free agency. And we're going to lose several core pieces. Most importantly would have been Matt Milano. Now the deal with Milano is can you keep him on the field? But the difference is night and day when Matt Milano's on the field and he took a bit of a haircut to stay, he would have got way more on the open market. Maybe even more importantly, they were able to keep John Feliciano, a guard who's kind of a Swiss army knife when Morse got hurt. You know, he could jump over and play center, and he was really effective. He, I think he only gave up three quarterback hits all year long. I mean, this guy's just a real solid guy. To that end, Morris, who signed the big free agency deal a couple of years ago to come to Buffalo, he restructured his contract to take less, and then Feliciano stayed. And then the home run was they were able to keep Daryl Williams, got a three-year deal for this guy for $28 million, and he'd have got way more on the open market. And he became a guy that fell in their lap and was a starting right tackle. And, you know, he was going against monsters all year long and they'd leave him on an Island so they could focus on the backside of Josh Allen. So they kept their core together and, you know, Bean's been phenomenal in the draft, finding diamonds in the rough. So by not, it was basically they, they won by not losing anything when it looked like they were going to lose a lot. And, And then, Shaq Barrett stays with Tampa Bay. They're big winners. I mean, that guy was a big piece of their puzzle. You know, I think it's interesting when you kind of look around here, a lot of NFC teams just sort of franchise tagging guys, keeping them around that way. It's the AFC teams that have been very active here so far. Kansas City looks like Joe Thune is going to wind up being uh, their new left guard. So that's a great signing for them as, you know, we kind of saw what happened with their offensive line with injuries, attrition, all of that uh, late in the playoffs there. Browns with a phenomenal pickup in John Johnson, the safety from the Rams. That was one of their biggest weaknesses last season was the safety position. Now they should get Delpit back off of injury. They get Johnson back there now. They they already have the offense. We know that. Now they start building up this defense a little bit. And, I mean, that's a team that, you know, and I'm not just saying this because I'm a Browns fan. I think they win this division this year. You know, Baltimore kind of regressing a little bit. Lamar Jackson coming off of a pretty lackluster season overall. We all know the Steelers are kind of in a weird spot. Bud Dupree now goes to the Titans. Big Ben, not a whole lot of mileage left on those tires. So it is always fascinating to take a look at. Then you got the draft coming up here in, what, about a month or so. So, you know, good to chat some NFL here. And, you know, it's especially it's especially difficult for us, though, as people covering this industry where NFL free agency just happens to fall the week of March Madness. Yeah, but the NFL, once it starts to rear its head a little bit, right, they're always at the forefront virtually year-round. And the the difference is, I just a, a little final footnote on what you were talking about, Cleveland, Buffalo, you got Micah Hyde, the safety that went there. He had a stone in his shoe, right, when the Packers let him go. These guys are openly recruiting players to come there. And Cleveland, right? The, 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 what players are sitting there? Like Jay Watt ends up in Arizona. Hey, the weather's good and all that. And he, you know, he got the dough. The taxes in New York State are a train wreck. These guys want to win. You know, players want to win. So all of a sudden, you know, markets like Cleveland and Buffalo, the guys used to thumb their nose at, now they're looking long and hard at. And the big thing is, when these guys are heading into free agency, it is such a quarterback league. They're looking at who's the who's the quarterback? Who's the guy that's going to drive the bus here? And can you win with that quarterback? And when they look at Mayfield and they look at Josh Allen, they believe that they're in with a chance to win the whole damn thing. No, it's an excellent point to end on with our NFL chat here. We'll have plenty of time to talk more NFL, especially in the lead up to the draft here uh, with Brian. But 
I guess we could say the big story of this week is the NCAA tournament that starts here on Thursday night with the first four games, Norfolk State, App State, Wichita State, Drake, Mount St. Mary's, Texas Southern, and then Michigan State and UCLA. Round one starts here on Friday, carries over into Saturday. So a little bit different of a schedule format here for the tournament. You did a video preview, kind of an overview with a look at the number one seeds and some of the other teams in the field here over on our ATS YouTube page. And Certainly encourage listeners to check that out. But the top four seeds here, Gonzaga, Baylor, Illinois, and Michigan, not really any surprises out of that group. No, I would say Michigan. And and sometimes when something sticks out like that, they'll kind of circle the wagons and put it all to rest. But Michigan of the ones looks to be the most vulnerable to me. Uh, I think Baylor maybe could end up getting a tiger by the tail eventually with Ohio State. I think Gonzaga draws very, very well, and Illinois looks like a monster. We just saw that great game with Illinois and Ohio State, and that would be set up for a rematch in the semifinals at the Final Four. And I I think you could see Illinois uh, and Ohio State get there if Michigan's a bit vulnerable. Or could you imagine if Michigan did get there and you had three – Big Ten teams in the Final Four, that'd be pretty remarkable. Just to get two one seeds for that conference is pretty pretty wild. But I look at the overview, Adam. Nine from the Big Ten, seven teams in from the Big 12. They're all top 20 teams. The ACC, quote-unquote, had a down year with seven teams that still get in, and then the SEC has six. And there's always a conference that really just flounders And I'm wondering, I really, I'm a fan of Alabama. I like Alabama, but I wonder if the SEC isn't the the one that may be a touch on the sketchy side. Uh, You know, maybe the, maybe the big 12, you know, there's a lot of flash and no substance, but I think the big 10 is really solid. And then the ACC, it's not going to shock anybody if they don't do well, but the one thing you learn over the years with the committee, like Syracuse, right? Really? You know, Syracuse gets in, but Michigan State and UCLA are playing in the play-in game. Some of this stuff, Oklahoma State was a four. West Virginia's a three. Oklahoma State just beat West Virginia twice. You know, it's little things like that. But I'm wondering if the SEC maybe is a bit vulnerable here. Yeah, I think those are all good points. And that's something we talked about yesterday on our mega show where we previewed all four regions with Kyle Hunter. And, And if our listeners have not checked that out yet, I very much encourage you to do so. Brian knows this as well as I do, but when you really nail a show, you can feel it. And I think we really nailed that show uh, on Monday with Kyle Hunter talking about all four regions and some general betting tips here for the NCAA tournament. And and that was kind of the consensus that we came to yesterday as well, Brian, that, you know, Michigan does feel like the most vulnerable of the one seeds. And in part because of their draw, if LSU beats St. Bonaventure, and I, I do think that will be the case, nothing against the Bonnies, but you know, LSU with that tremendous offensive upside, that's not an easy game for Michigan in the second round. And then Florida State looms in the Sweet 16, a game that we kind of highlighted as probably coming to fruition here on yesterday's show. I think those are both very difficult games for Michigan. And I just don't see that in the top half of the bracket for any of the other number one seeds. I think Oklahoma State could give Illinois a game with Cade Cunningham and just how strong he is. But I still think Illinois is just clearly the top team in that bracket by a pretty decent margin, at least of the teams up in the top half of it. So I agree. I think Michigan is the most vulnerable of the number one seeds. And look, I mean, if they play at, you know, top end Michigan caliber, then they'll find themselves, you know, in the final four here. But I do think there are enough concerns about them and about the draw that could sort of hold them out. And the thing about Baylor, and and this is something that, you know, it's is kind of narrative based in nature, but sometimes you get these teams in the tournament that have these high seeds, these high ceilings, and you just sit there and go, you know what? They still have to prove it to me. And, and Baylor sort of feels like one of those teams where I really want to see them prove it to me that they can, you know, take these expectations and get through their region. Now there's so many ways to attack this thing. It, it's great fun. And the funny thing is you mentioned the LSU Bonnie game. Uh, I'm a backer of the Bonnies big time. And so last night I said, oh, I, you know what? I have not seen LSU play that much. So I went and I watched 
a healthy chunk of the LSU Arkansas game last night. And this LSU team, man, they can knock it down from three. But I watched them against Arkansas, and there, there was really no defense in the game. And and I'm so I'm watching LSU, and I'm trying to picture the five Bonnies playing defense against them. That's an interesting game. Let me tell you something. The Bonnies are listen. LSU is a one point favorite. The funny thing is when the bracketology shows come out, everybody LSU against uh, Michigan like it's automatic. You know, LSU against Michigan in the second round. And I'm sitting there going, fellas, it's a one point spread. You know, it's, it's like not a, and the Bonnies actually hurt themselves by destroying VCU, destroying St. Louis, then destroying VCU. They upped the ante, went from a 10 to a nine. All right. So per, conceptually they could, they'll get Michigan in the second round if they win the game in a weird way. Their current form hurt them a little bit in terms of seeding. But the lack of depth is what's concerning for the Bonnies. But if they stay out of foul trouble, if Mark Schmidt can defend the three and force the guards to drive in the paint, the Oshini kid's the best shot blocker in college basketball. And all five of those kids are juniors, Adam. By the way, all five of them are juniors. And BC just hired a head coach. And the fear was, that Mark Schmidt was going to leave for BC because it's his alma mater. St. Bonaventure's a winner before they ever walk on the court here. All five of these kids are coming back next year, and the only job the coach probably would have left for got filled. So I, I think I think St. Bonaventure is a real shot to win that game. I think it's one of the most interesting of the games here in the first round, that 8-9 game. And, and I always love those games where you've got really contrasting styles, teams that have to win with offense versus teams that win with defense pace wars where you've got one team that wants to run up and down the floor and another team that wants to play it very slowly you know which team winds up winning out in that type of situation always interesting for me to the point that I made about Baylor here real quickly before we step away from from that uh, Baylor elite eight appearances in 2010 and 2012 but then since then they've gone to the sweet 16 twice in five tournament appearances lost both of those games and lost them badly. They lost by 17 to Wisconsin in 2014, by 20 to South Carolina in 2017. So that's kind of uh, the point that I was looking to illustrate there yep. about the Baylor Bears. Go ahead. And then the other thing I would say, too, you know, I mean, I'm very much of the belief there are those that aren't. But if a conference is playing well, you look to other games down the line in the tournament because the conference is playing well or if they're stubbing their toe. Uh, that one year, the Big East got nine in eons ago. Oh, this, they're monsters. They got nine. They went two and seven, you know, in the opening round. So when somebody says, oh, this conference is a monster. Well, it's a monster when inside their conference. It's like Gonzaga over there. We shoot holes at Gonzaga. They play nobody. But when they get their chance against the big boy, yeah, they haven't cut the nets down. But they got a real shot to do it again, only a two-to-one favorite to win the whole thing. But I think you look for common opponents, and I would throw this at you. If St. Bonaventure plays very well against LSU, if they win, or if it's a great game that goes right down to the wire, later in the day, you absolutely want to take a long, hard look at Virginia Commonwealth. They're catching five and a half against Oregon. If you didn't watch the A-10 game, you go, oh, the Bonnies killed VCU. Well, their best player, the conference player of the year, Bones Highland got his third foul six minutes into that game. He basically was on the sidelines the entire first half. And when he came in, St. Bonaventure had a lead, took the air out of the ball. VCU made two good runs at him. Most of the points that Highland got were at the foul line. But if St. Bonaventure plays well against LSU, don't kid yourself. You know, VCU, if VCU had won that game, Adam by a bucket, or it's a great game went down the wire, and VCU won. VCU's catching three and a half against Oregon. They got murdered by St. Bonaventure, so they're catching five and a half. But they got murdered because their best player had foul trouble. This is a completely different game. So if the Bonnies play well later in the night, same day on Saturday, you definitely want a piece of VCU against Oregon. Well, and that's a concept that we look at a lot during college football bowl season, where you know the teams that are not playing well in the early bowl games – money comes in against them very, very quickly. And obviously, you know, those lines get to sit there and marinate for, you know, weeks at a time. But it's the same thought process that you're talking about, where, you know, when a conference does really well early in the bowl season, 
those teams get propped up a little bit for their upcoming bowl games. On the flip side, when those conferences are not performing well, uh, you know, we do see money come in against those teams. So I think that's a good point. Definitely something to watch for here. And well, yeah, buddy, too, buddy you can say you can set your clock to it when we get to, to bowl season that the Mac is going to stink in bowls and the Mountain West is going to be good in bowls against the spread. It, it happens every year. And we did talk about that on yesterday's show in terms of conferences that have done well in the round of 64, those that have not. A reminder of that from yesterday's show that Kyle Hunter gave us some notes on. The Big Sky, 4-10-1 against the spread in the round of 64. ACC, 36-52-1. So the ACC has not done well in the first round. Some conferences that have done well, the MAC, 10-5. The OVC, 12-5. The Big Ten, 48-35. We talked about a few more, but I encourage you to check out that show from yesterday to kind of take a look at. I know you do follow the Mac a little bit, and you know this one's obviously kind of challenging to discuss between Ohio and Virginia because Virginia, with significant COVID issues, they face a 6 p.m. deadline tonight to say whether or not they can actually make it to Indianapolis. And that game's scheduled for Saturday, and right now, based on the COVID-19 protocols, they won't even be able to travel to Indy until Friday. So Ohio may end up playing Louisville instead in that 13-4 game if Virginia can't go, but just on the surface, as we're looking at it here now, Brian, where we've seen Ohio money come in, you know, with the expectation of Virginia being shorthanded, that line's sitting now at seven or seven and a half in the market. Their guard, Jason Preston, they had issues. This kid is unbelievable. I think he's an NBA player, Jason Preston. Wait to see him play. Uh, He just, he runs the show. He's the maestro out there. I, I, I like Ohio catching the points against Virginia, seven and a half or eight. Ohio just really got hot, and they ran through uh, the the tournament, and they beat a very good Buffalo team. And I'm just looking. That game goes Saturday night at 7-15. Buffalo's playing Colorado State in the NIT. Buffalo could be heartbroken. They're not in the NCAA tournament. But if they play really well against Colorado State, it just enhances Ohio's chances even more. But we know Virginia's defense is spectacular. But this Preston kid, well, I, he really can. He can generate a lot of good stuff, and he's got a wonderful supporting cast. Ohio's playing really good basketball. And, and one other quick note that I would just say is an overview. Maybe you guys did talk about this. But, you know, I've been to numerous regionals over the years tournaments that are played here in vegas the one thing and i wonder if you know the barking dog is not the barking dog that we're normally accustomed to in the cinderella thing when you go to a regional and the building's full of twenty thousand people and let's say the you know, four teams are in in there obviously there's more to, to start but what happens is the 12-5 thing, everybody knows about the 12-5 thing. But other than the fan base of the team that's favored in the game, three-quarters of the building is rooting and rallying around the Cinderella. So it's not a neutral court game. So the dog is getting a push from the crowd. The crowd's not going to be a factor in this stuff. So I'm, I'm just saying it's food for thought. You know, we love all these big upsets, and there will be upsets. But but the, the big dog that can cover a number, they're not going to get the push they normally get from the crowd when the entire building, building rallies around them. No, that's an excellent point. That's something we didn't really talk about. We talked about the venues in terms of several different ones and the shooting backdrops and how that could incorporate you know some totals angles into the equation and how teams will not play on the same floor for the first round and the second round. They will be forced to play somewhere else. But that's an excellent point that, you know, that underdog often gets that little bit of a push as the crowd, because everybody wants to see that Cinderella story. As of course you, you know, bet on the higher seed and the favorite, but they do get that push from the fan, from the crowd, from the fan bases. And yeah, it's an excellent point, especially too, if it's a Cinderella going up against, you know, because obviously these regionals are spread out all over the country. You know, if it's a Cinderella going up against one of the home team's rivals, you know, then you really see that come to fruition uh, here with you know the muted crowds and all of that, I guess we'll kind of see what happens. But that's an excellent but, point. But there. not only, but not only 
because, hey, it's cool. Let's root for the underdog to pull off the upset. They're also rooting for the underdog because they want the good team out so their team doesn't have to play them in the next round. You know, I mean, so the crowd is a big factor in the regionals, and there's not going to be a crowd. The other thing is that's always, always something I, I really think about, and it does happen. You know, it used to be the 116s. It spreads to be 28 and a half, 29. Those big balloon numbers are gone. But if you're sitting there looking to lay a big number in the opening round, be wary of it is virtually the last chance for a coach to reward guys on the bench. You know, if if the line's 15 and a half, some team's got a 20 point lead with four minutes to go and the game's in the cookie jar. And they, from this point on, these games are going right down to the wire. He's going to let the biology major and he's going to let the scout team, all the, the guy that's the leader, and works his butt off in practice, but never gets to play. It's the last chance that kid's going to get his chance, and they'll do it. You know, hey, you got to play in the NCAA tournament. But what happens is you bring the three, four kids in with a 20-point lead with three minutes to go to reward them for all the hard work they did in practice. But the weaker team left their starters in, and all of a sudden they go on a 7-1 run at the end of the game and cover the number on the back door. So the, be very leery of the big, the big number, too. We, we talked about that on yesterday's show. It's a, it's a great point to make. And we also talked about it, it from a totals con, uh, context as well, because, you know, some coaches are going to tell these guys that, you know, at the end of the bench, the hype men, uh, so to speak, that, you know, look, just hold the ball, run the shot clock, you know, let, let's not embarrass them. Just go out there and, you know, you've got your time on the floor. Yeah, other game coaches, shuts down. It just right, shuts down. And other coaches are going to be like, you know what? Go ahead, run the offense. You know, go ahead and do what we do. And those kids may chuck from wherever, you know, those kids want their name in the box score. They want that little highlight of, you know, the bench going crazy for them. Cause they, oh, yeah, man. you know, all of that. So don't, well, you're, you're, you're sitting there, you're, you're, you know, four minutes to go. You only need 10 points for the game to go over the total. And they bring these guys in and they turn it over. There's a bunch of bad shots and they're always rooting for the one kid. Right. And the, the kid makes the three and the bench goes nuts. They all, you know, it may take that kid four shots to get the three pointer with 15 seconds left in the game, but a game that was flying over the total, all of a sudden just, you know, just drove into mud. Right. Or on the flip side, maybe nothing changes, you know, from a live betting standpoint, don't just assume that it's going to wind up being an under. Yeah, it could be. But, you know, maybe these teams go out there and these players are just excited and, you know, they're not going to listen to the coach or they're just going to kind of do their own thing. And, you know, they just kind of run the floor and all that. So, you know, you never know. And the other thing, I mean, an actual, you know, not the intangible thing. Those scenarios do happen, but, I mean, you're sitting there banking on that. I mean, but but the one thing would be also – if you've got a big lead, you got to play another game in 48 hours. You don't want to, you know, give them as much rest as you can if they got a tough game in the second round. And you don't want to get anybody hurt. Yeah, no, that's true. You know, watch, watch out for the minutes thing. You know, you're going to have some teams that are depth shy that, you know, guys are going to have to play down to the wire, you know, play the vast majority of the game. Maybe it goes to overtime, something like that. They got to turn around and play in, you know, 46, 44 hours, something like that. Sometimes that's not always incorporated into the line accurately. It will get picked on probably pretty quickly, but sometimes that's not incorporated into the line uh, that they, that gets posted. You know, the market puts it there. But, you know, I, I love the NCAA tournament for a variety of reasons. I love the month of March for college basketball overall because I think we've got so many things to look at, so many betting angles and opportunities, and, you know, it should be a lot of fun here once again with this NCAA tournament. Brian, one thing, I don't know how fun it's actually going to be. It certainly probably won't be as fun as the players last week or the Arnold Palmer two weeks ago, or even the WGC match play next week. But the Honda Classic just happens to be scheduled in a bad spot. You know, it falls basically between WGC events, or, you know, you know, the Players' Championship and all that, like I just talked about. So we don't have a very good field here at PGA National. And furthermore, this is not a fun course to play. I mean, you look at this course, it's been in play since 2007. Only three times have we had a player finish double digit under par and win this tournament. Ricky Fowler was 12 under in 2017. He won by four shots. Rory was 12 under in 2012, won by a couple shots over Tom Gillis and Tiger Woods. One of those guys you've probably heard of. And then Camilo, Camille Vijegas in 2010, 
13 under, won by five shots over Anthony Kim. So in two of the years where we had winners of 10 under or better, or 12 under or better, they were the only players in double digits under par. So not only does this wind up being a pretty easy event to bypass because of the schedule, I think also there are a lot of guys that just don't want to deal with the challenges of this course. That's part of it. And the, the crazy thing is the odds makers are doing a great job. I mean, I go nuts on the golf betting half for years. And a buddy of mine said last week, what's the next tournament? I said, Andrew, I said, oh, yeah. I said, the next tournament, Daniel Berger is winning the Honda Classic. <laughs> and he's 11 to 1. He always plays well here, even when he was hurt and his game wasn't right. Now he's one of the most consistent guys. Well, you're not, you know, 11 to 1. I'm, I love Daniel Berger's chances, but the price, he's the favorite. Honestly, the, the hope would be, you know, this guy's five shots back or something going to the weekend and you get him at 20 to 1. I mean, that, that's when, to me, I would jump in on Berger, and he makes complete and utter sense. Uh, Sung J M has played well here, obviously. Uh, Shane Lowry's current form is pretty good. Westwood, can he keep it going? What a great uh, few weeks for him. Kind of snake bit a little bit. Um, I thought very, very deserving of having that chance to win last week. It's uh, so ironic for Westwood. Both of those tournaments were lost on the par five late in the round where the week before he's going against DeChambeau and DeChambeau on the par fives in the bunker had a layup and Westwood was, I think down one and he had a six iron into the par five. He left it just short. He hit a good chip, but it was above the whole five foot slider. He didn't make it. And then on 16 at uh, the players, he catches the limb of the Oak tree and he got a par on the par five or he'd have been tied. And then, by the way, don't sleep on that. He rolled in that 20-footer on 18. That was a half-million-dollar putt. <laughs> you know, So Westwood's current form is remarkable. You know, the price, 22 to 1. No great shakes there. But I think what you're talking about, the difficulty of the course, again, brings in to play the guys that are playing from the short grass. And, you know, you mentioned some of the guys that can win. Um, but I, I would look at a Zach Johnson at 90 to one. James Hahn is a guy at 90 to one that his scorecards are roller coaster. He has, you know, some bad holes, but boy, I mean, James Hahn's current form, he can get hot and he can go low. I think, I think there are some guys out there you could swing for uh, Adam, but I think then you really come back to the in play wagering on Friday. To your point about Lee Westwood, I'm looking at Westwood to miss the cut this week. And I know he's in outstanding form, but he even mentioned it in his post-round interview on Sunday that you know he was tired. And you could see that, especially off the tee box. He was very, very erratic. He had a lot of great iron and wedge shots to save par on holes where he put himself into very bad situations off the tee. And you know he said on Monday he was playing around at Augusta National with his son. So it's not even like, you know, he really had that Monday recovery day or anything like that. Not to say it's super taxing to go play around at Augusta with your kid, but simply to say that, you know, after playing a lot of high stress holes in the last two tournaments, sure. Monday he gets to play at Augusta and he's 47 years old. I mean, you know, I'm sure he won't play the match play next week. Maybe he will. I, I don't know. But, you know, I think, it, I think this week I wouldn't be shocked if, you know, it does come back to hurt him, that fatigue level on a course that, as we just talked about, is very, very tough. And and the one thing you said, and we'll sort of go through some of these players here, you know, a guy like Zach Johnson, he doesn't hit it far, but this is another course where distance isn't really the be-all, end-all. You, you want to play in the short grass because a lot of these holes are pretty straightforward. So you need angles at the greens. And if you're erratic off the tee, you don't have a great angle at the green. So those guys that do just kind of hit it down the middle and go ahead and play it again, those are guys that really aren't bad looks here this week. You know, and I'm just, I'm reading the article as we speak. I knew it was going to happen. Uh, so many of these guys live in West Palm. And in the past, the Monday qualifiers have actually done quite well here. Brian Compton shot a 65 in the Monday qualifier. Uh, interesting. I Don't sleep on the Monday qualifiers that get in here and actually step. I mean, I didn't even know if he's offered. <laughs> uh, but this familiarity, so many of these golfers live in that neck of the woods. It's a, I mean, it's a great course. I mean, you know, the, the finish is tough, really tough. 
Yeah, it is. You got the bear trap there, 15 through 17. Uh, the, the qualifier group was actually, I remember one of the, one of the global sports books, one of them in uh, overseas in Europe, I think actually offered odds on the qualifier because the field was so good and had so many, you know, well-known players in it that they actually offered odds uh, on the qualifier. So I thought that was kind of interesting. This is a tournament here. You know, I agree with you. I mean, I think you could make a strong case for Berger to say the least. Lucas Glover is a guy that I'm kind of looking at here, not in the greatest of current form, but a couple of top fives here, usually a pretty good iron player, usually pretty good on approach. He's 70 to one this week. Matthew Neesmith, actually one of the best ball strikers in this field, because this is not a field really high on ball striking. You've got a guy like Berger who's out there. Keegan Bradley's got some good ball striking numbers, but Matthew Neesmith, he's 90 to one, and he's a really good ball striker. So He's a guy that I kind of looked at this week, but you know, really outside of that, I mean, I I think it's just kind of guesswork. You know, I think you kind of throw some things out there on some of these long shot prices, maybe a Chez Reeve who, you know, doesn't play here often. That was something else that kind of struck me here. Guys like Kevin Chappell and and KJ Choi and Henrik Stenson. And, you know, some of these longtime veteran guys that usually don't play this event are playing it here this week. And, And I thought that was kind of an interesting development. Yeah, and the other guy who's current form, if I'm correct, and again, browsing and trying to sing a show tune while I'm looking, uh, his form's pretty good, is Richie Wierenski is 90-1. to Yeah, I mean, he was fourth in the uh, Arnold Palmer and 21st at the American Express, 22nd at the Waste Management. that's, That's pretty solid. I mean, I I would – Rowinski's a guy I think you could actually take a peek at at 90-1. to 1. That That's not that's not bad. He got cut. He got cut at the players, but there we saw some great players just come out of the gate on Thursday and Friday and play awful. Yeah, Wierenski last year here at this event, 17th, his best finish all time. Two missed cuts, a 78th, and then a 17th. So, you know, obviously this course has a learning curve to it, as we just talked about. I mean, look – Sung J.M. won last year at six under. Patty Harrington was six under when he won the playoff over Berger in 2015. You know, we're talking about playoff winners at eight under. Justin Thomas in 2018. So this is a tough course, a course where par is a good score. And that's why you look at guys that, you know, are accurate off the tee because you got to get to the green in regulation to give yourself a chance at a par, which is a good score here on a course like this. Uh, We'll have a lot to talk about next week. With oh, my favorite. I was just going to say, I didn't thank you. You were going there. Uh, my favorite, one of my favorite events of the year in all of sports, and that's the match play. I mean, you can watch these guys starting out, and then you know they win a match four and two or something, and they were lucky to win the match, and they're made a favorite the next day. Like They had no business winning that match. You know, the other guy they played had bad breaks. The, the guy that wins the match four and two hit two that were going OB hit a tree and came back into fairway. And the guy won four and two when he should have lost the match and the wrong favorite is, is there for you the next day. I love the match play. Well, and also too, I mean, there are some guys that just, they don't love the match play format. You know, they'll, they'll be out there because it's a WGC event with lots of money in play, but some guys don't really love match play and other guys absolutely relish the opportunity. So there's also that too, you know, we, t- and it's a good transition over to NASCAR where we talk about guys that are more comfortable on the mile, mile and a half tracks, stuff like that. Guys that maybe aren't as comfortable on the short tracks. It's the same thing with match play where some guys just, they prefer stroke play. Other guys, they're all about match play. And I think that there'll be some good opportunities to take advantage let me, of. Next let week me throw sure. a wild one at you in advance. Go for because, it. Because, because the game is just out of sorts. But we've seen guys resurrect themselves in the match play. The problem is, you know, the guy can do all kinds of good things, but he always has the snowman and stroke play and takes himself out. Ricky Fowler is a mess right now. But you can be a mess in match play, and the hole you took at eight and you were going to miss the cut and go home is a hole, and then you go to the next tee. The guys guys that are just – they're out of sorts – and they're just not getting it done in stroke play, all of a sudden match play can wake him up, you know, and he, he could flag it. He could have four bad holes, four horrific holes that would make him shoot an 81, 
But those four bad holes, the rest of them are great holes, and he can win the match. So there are guys like Ricky Fowler that could be dangerous next week. Yeah, I love it. Good thought there. And uh, I always root for Ricky. I know, as you said, he's an absolute train wreck right now. Uh, but definitely root for Ricky to, to kind of get these get everything turned around here and get everything squared away. All right, so we go to the NASCAR side of things here to finish up the show. And the Folds of Honor Quick Trip 500 at Atlanta Motor Speedway. Mile and a half track here, actually 1.54 miles, if you want to be really accurate about that. There will be two races at Atlanta here this year, first time since 2010. They picked up the date that Kentucky Speedway used to have. So that'll be the Quaker State 400 coming up on July 11th. But as we look at this one here, Brian, you know, last week, things kind of get back to normal a little bit. Martin Truex Jr., the winner, Joey Logano, had a really strong effort. I liked him last week, finished his second, leads the most laps. You know, it is what it is. But Hamlin and Keslowski both in the top five. Same thing with Chase Elliott. Kind of the status quo that we expected to see with this run of races at Homestead, Vegas, Phoenix, and now Atlanta, the dirt race coming up next week. God only knows what will happen there. But as we look at the odds board here for Atlanta, Harvick plus 550. These are coming from DraftKings, by the way. Truex, 6-1. to one. Larson, 650. Keslowski, 7. Elliott and Hamlin, 8. Logano, 9. Kyle Busch, 10. You know, back to pretty much what we're used to seeing at the top of the board. And I would assume that probably one of those single-digit prices wins. Well, the one thing I would say to you, you look at the recent winners in Atlanta. Keselowski's won two of the last three. Harvick won in 2018. But we said this, in Phoenix, he couldn't even run good at Phoenix. Something's not right with Harvick right now. He's fade material. Yes, he's going to probably step up and win. But there's nothing saying to me this is the week it's going to be for Harvick. He's been fade material. 2016 and 2015, Jimmy Johnson. Casey Kane, 24. Wait a minute. <laughs> All right, past winners way back. Kyle Busch, Denny Hamlin. Uh, I don't know. Something goofy could happen here. I mean, Larson's running really good. Uh, that's pretty evident. What do you got for Blaney out of curiosity? 16 to 1. That's an overlay. That car is good no matter where he goes. The guy is absolutely cursed. I don't know that anybody here is a stick out. And this may be the week. I mean, but Blaney's there every week and something just happens to him. Maybe what hasn't he been in the 10 to one range a little bit of late? Yeah, I think he's kind of been in that 12, 12 or 14 ranges. He's kind of struggled here a little bit. Good car the last couple of weeks. I mean, he won the first stage last week at Phoenix fifth at Vegas. So yeah, he's, he's had a good car and Ford has four straight wins here. So keep that in mind as well. One thing that's really interesting to me here is that Kevin Harvick, in his last 10 starts in Atlanta, has led 1,212 laps. That's more than the next nine guys over the last 10 races combined. Yep. So this is a dominant track for Kevin Harvick. Yeah, it is in Phoenix, though, as well. And I, I don't mean to throw that at you, that you'd have that at your beck and call. But, you know, Phoenix was also the track that, you know, it, you almost penciled Harvick. Something's just not right. He can't get the speed out of the car. He's going into pit row on Sunday. He's I can't. I'm not. The car's not right. He's not generating speed. And as it's not like he became a bad driver overnight. Something's amiss with the engine. Well, and and that's the thing is if Harvick doesn't run well here after not running well last week at Phoenix, that is all of the information that you need to know exactly what Brian is talking about here, that Harvick is a fade guy as we go forward. And to me, I think for the most part in the dirt race, the two short tracks at Martinsville and Richmond, then at Talladega, he's probably going to be a fade guy anyway. And I wonder what those matchup prices will look like to go against him in some of those upcoming races. I don't know if I'll, I don't know if I have the heart to do it this week because of all of his past success here. But as you said, something is misfiring with this team with this vehicle, with this driver, whatever the case may be. And and look, if he doesn't do well this week with how dominant he's been, then he's straight fade material. It sounds like you're already on that train. Well, uh, I, I did it in Vegas. Data point I, to do it. I, I did it in Vegas. I, did it, I was so close to the home run. I said, play on Larson in, in matchups, fade Harvick in all matchups, and Keselowski was my pick to win the race. Well, you know, Harvick ran nowhere. Uh and 
Larson wins the race. Yeah, you know, and the thing of it is for me, I like Keselowski this week. I mean, he's won two of the last four times here in Atlanta. He's obviously had a very strong car, three top five finishes here so far. Only Hamlin has more with four. I like Keselowski. I like the way that Ford runs here on this course. One thing, you know, I was kind of looking at Kyle Busch or Kurt Busch, excuse me, a little bit here at 22 to one because Kurt Busch is a guy, this is probably at his stage of his career, his best track. The thing of it is, now he's running that Chevrolet. So, you know, some of his better finishes here did come when he was driving a Ford. Last three years, he's been running the Chevy. So that's something that concerns me a little bit is, is it a Ford thing? Is it a Chevy thing? Is it a driver thing? I don't know. But, you know, we talk about course form guys in golf where they just feel comfortable going to a certain place. They know the blade of grass. They know the angles, all of that. Some guys just know racing lines. So I don't know if I can take Bush at 22 to one, but I think for a top three finish at plus 550, and as more betting options come available throughout the week, you know, Kurt Bush in matchups, uh, in group matchups, stuff like that. I think he has a good run in him here this week. Yeah. The one other guy that is kind of a wild card moving forward, he's playing with house money, uh, and the car is good, is William Byron. You know, I'm saying, oh, hey, you got that win under your belt. You can do all kinds of stuff with alternative pit strategies and things of that nature. He ran eighth at Phoenix, but he's got a good car, and he's got a win under his belt, and they can be really aggressive with their strategies. So it's not going to surprise me that Byron wins another one. And even though he won a race, he's not getting any respect in the odds. What's he at? He's probably at least 20. 20, yeah, 20. So it sounds like I got Keselowski, you got Blaney, and, you know, we got some angles to look at here in matchups as well with with that Harvick fade, you know, kind of being, I, I think, the big headline here from what we've talked about. Yep. No, it's great to have it back. Um, I can't wait for this dirt race. How the heck is that going to work out? I have no idea. I, I've been reading a couple of articles about it, and one guy who was really excited about it was Austin Dillon. So so take that for what it's worth. I, I don't know, but it'd be the first dirt race since 1970 for the cup series. So it should be a lot of fun. And if nothing else, you know, like we talked about this season is very, very different. And I think that not only does it bring some more betting opportunity to the, to the forefront, but also I just, I, you know, I think it enhances the interest and the excitement across the board. He's been kind of a bad luck bear and it's been a long couple of years, but Kyle Bush in that dirt race might be interesting. Cut his teeth on the bull ring out here on the dirt there you and go. has always been very good at Bristol. Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. I'll be joining you for a segment today on Sportsbook Radio in the 2 o'clock Eastern hour. But what else you got going on right now, man? Oh, boy, what don't we have going on? What a week. I'll be on the road, be out at Sunset Station tomorrow, Thursday, Friday, over in the Superbook at the Westgate. Oscar Goodman, the former mayor of Las Vegas, is coming with the show, girls, and it's always good fun on Thursday, the big tournament preview. Friday will be on. The games are on. If you're coming to town, Please stop by and say hi. That'll be good fun. Vegas Hockey Hotline, 1 p.m. Pacific time, KSHP.com. There's a listen live function. Great guests in the hockey world. The Hockey Betting Podcast.ca. Uh, Cam Stewart and I do that. All kinds of stuff, but busy on my Twitter. The best thing is uh, at Brian Blessing. Everything's pretty much there, and we look forward to having you on. And we're on Sirius Channel 204 and the Sports Grid Radio Network weekdays from 2 to 4 Eastern. And, of course, we got some videos over on our ATS YouTube page from Brian as well. So very busy man, jack of all trades here, Brian Blessing. Again, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline, at Brian Blessing on Twitter. Brian, appreciate your time as always, man. Thank you so much for joining me. We'll talk to you again next week. You got it, Adam. Have a great day. There you go. Once again, Brian Blessing, at Brian Blessing on Twitter to find all of the fine work that he does out there in this gambling and sports space. Coming up on Wednesday, we'll talk NCAA tournament, maybe some NIT stuff with Kiev O'Neill from the Odds Breakers. Thursday, Brad Powers joins me for some FCS college football and the NCAA tournament. And then Friday, I'll do the Betters Box, my MLB betting podcast. I'll get that out bright and early in the morning here so that you can check that out before you settle in for the first round of the NCAA tournament. That'll do it for me. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And I will talk to you again tomorrow.